Constitutional Conversations is a series of discussions by America's leading scholars about the principles, framing, ratification, and implementation of constitutional government in the United States. This series is hosted by the James Madison Memorial Fellowship Foundation of Alexandria, Virginia. George Washington, with respect to slavery, was, I would say, from the beginning, a queasy slave owner. It is to be certain that he owned, bought, sold slaves in the course of his life. Though it must be understood that he began with simply having inherited, received slaves, and then stepped into the full exercise of the relationship, the profession, the business. But he gradually became doubtful about the propriety of slavery. As his commitment to republicanism grew, so grew also his doubt about the rightfulness of slavery. And he eventually matured and became profoundly anti-slavery. This shows up in policy when the Jay Treaty is approved in 1795, ratified by Washington, confirmed by the Senate eventually, it leaves out a critical provision, the provision for the return of the slave property that had been carried away in the Revolutionary War, and which was one of the chief demands of the Americans as they sought to settle the outstanding issues from the 1783 Treaty of Paris, which settled the Revolutionary War. He left it out, he left it out because, as is described in an essay by Alexander Hamilton, it is against the law of nature and it is morally inappropriate. Washington also gave public testimony about the wrongfulness of slavery while hoping to lead even the Virginia legislature to do something to establish manumission, abolition. He was disappointed about that because they didn't do it. He expressed that disappointment, but that remained fundamentally private. There was, however, also a fundamentally private resolve, which comes to its full fruition in his will, his final testimony and testament, in which he sets free his own slaves. But he doesn't do it immediately, and that has led some people to doubt that he was serious because he said they will be free upon the death of his wife, Martha. But what people failed to understand is what Washington was doing was guaranteeing that all the slaves would indeed be free because the law, the common law at the time, declared a widow's third of any estate, no matter what the will of the decedent might have been, so that his purpose could have been defeated had he not tied it to the death of Martha and freed it from the condition of the widow's third. So Washington gave at least that testimony to the country. His will becomes public. The public knows once it is revealed that he thinks slavery is wrong, the slavery, so the slaves should be freed, and that they should be provided for as he provided in his will. And I might say one more thing. It's important to see that Merely freeing slaves is not necessarily a very generous thing to do because they are freed in the face of an important question, what do I do, where do I go? Uh, Washington had to build his estate, his resources, to achieve the position he finally achieved of being able to provide for the slaves that he freed, which he did. Constitutional Conversations is made possible by a generous grant from the Fairley S. Dickinson, Jr. Foundation. Constitutional Conversations is made possible by the James Madison Education Fund. <laughs>